I am still contending with some basic sins. I have certain habits till this day and I'm struggling to rid myself of these habits. How can I be this individual of high aspirations when I know behind closed doors about me what nobody else knows? Our predecessors never allowed their sinful nature, which is every human being, to be a justification for low ambitions in life. Never. And that's why when they came to Al Hasan al Basri and a man said to him, I don't want to enjoin what is good and I don't want to forbid what is evil, I fear that I will say something that I'm not doing myself. Al Hasan, he said to him, This is exactly what Shaytan wants to convince people. You are a sinner, so you have no right to be advising other people so that nobody enjoys good and nobody forbids what is evil. The poet he says, If you're not going to advise people because you are a sinner, then who's going to advise them after Muhammad And here I share with you a very emotional story belonging to a man called Abu Mihjan al-Thaqafi. And Abu Mihjan was a noble companion of the Prophet but he had a particular downfall, a sin that he kept falling weak to, and that is the consumption of alcohol. So it's not even a minor one, subhanAllah. In fact, he loved alcohol so much that he has poetry. This is earlier on in his life, telling people who bury him eventually when he passes away, then make sure you bury me next to a vine grape tree so that I can drink from its wine even when I have died underground. When I die, bury me next to something that I can drink wine from that can nourish he said my bones and nourish my skin Abu Mihjan would drink alcohol and then they would bring him to the Khalifa Umar radiallahu anhu and he would be lashed for it and then he would drink alcohol again and he would be brought he would be punished for it this happened again and again and it was no use and this continued to happen till the battle of Qadisiyah the battle of Qadisiyah at the time of Umar led by the Muslim general Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas against the Persians and this was the decisive battle that caused the collapse of the entire Persian empire never to stand up again and Abu Mihjan was part of the army and guess what happens just before the battle erupts Abu Mihjan is born to Sa'ad ibn Waqqas, he has been caught drinking alcohol again. So Sa'ad ibn Waqqas detains Abu Mihjan before the battle as a punishment and he is shackled in a cell. And now, subhanAllah, the battle erupts between the Muslims and the Persians. And it was a ferocious battle that lasted for days that caused the opening of the Madain of Persia. And Abu Mihjan can now hear from the other side of the wall the throwing of spears and the neighing of horses, the launching of arrows and the hitting with swords and the piercing of bodies. And he knows that the Rahmah of Allah has just descended upon the Muslims. He knows that the the markets of Jannah have now opened up and the gates of Jannah are opened up and that's where he wanted to be. He was upset to be in that situation. So he looks to the wife of Sa'ad and Abu Waqqas and he says to her, I ask you in the name of Allah that you release my shackles, please. Allow me to join the battlefield and I give you a promise that if we are victorious on this day, I will personally come back to the cell and I will put the shackles on my feet myself. And if I die, then good riddance to me, I am bothering you all. And then he began to utter words of poetry to encourage her. So she hears these words of poetry and his sincerity in wanting to join the Mujahideen, the fighters. And so she unshackles him. And then he takes the horse of Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, the Muslim general, who was ill at the time. So he was unable to participate in the battle, but he was supervising from a distance. So he jumped on the horse of Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, the horse of the Muslim general, called al balqa And he runs into the battlefield and he begins to fight. And he's covering his face. And the Muslims are saying, Hada Malak, this must be an angel. What type of fighting is this? Allahu Akbar. Sa'ad radiallahu anhu, he's watching the battle and now the course of the the battle is beginning to change. And he says, who is this? He said, the running of that animal resembles the running of Al-Balqa, my horse. And the method of attack, the style of combat here is the style of Abu Mihjan. But Abu Mihjan is in prison. And then his wife says to him, that is Abu Mihjan, that's your horse. She told him the story. The battle, alhamdulillah, subsided. The Muslims were victorious. The whole of the Persian empire collapsed in the hands of the Muslims. And its gold and its silver was transferred from Persia to the city of Medina to be spent and distributed in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Abu Mihjan, sticks to his promise and he makes his way from the battlefield into the cell and he shackles his feet. And Sa'ad Nabi Waqqas comes into the cell and he sees Abu Mihjan and then he lowers himself to the ground and Sa'ad personally opens the shackles and he says to him, I swear by Allah, I will never flog you for the drinking of alcohol ever again. And Abu Mihjan, he said, and I swear by Allah, I will never drink alcohol ever again. Allahu Akbar. Notice how Abu Mihjan did not use his weakness in front of a major sin to justify his low ambitions. No. And in fact, having high aspirations and working towards an Islamic vision is one of the key ways of ensuring that you stay steadfast as a Muslim. So don't wait to become righteous in order to find your high aspirations. Be a Muslim of high aspirations and watch how these sins will be washed away naturally as a consequence of that because you will not want to be slowed down by a sin now that you've defined yourself by something that is bigger than yourself and bigger than life.
And there are three paybacks, three treasures at least that come when you live with high aspirations as a Muslim. The first of them is a thabat, steadfastness. If you are struggling to be a practicing Muslim, be a Muslim of high aspirations, and as a byproduct, you become inshallah a practicing Muslim. See how a bird is able to fly high in the sky, and the higher the bird is able to fly in the sky, the higher it will be from harm's way. And similarly, your ambition, those are your wings, and the higher your ambition flies into the sky, the further you are away from shaitan and his whisperings. And that's why you notice some of the most practicing and dedicated people you know in your life, they are men and women who are defined by lofty aspirations. They have a project, they have something they need to attend to, they have a strategy they want to put forward for the sake of Allah. Number two, mental health, happiness, well-being. There is a study from the University of Pennsylvania that found evidence to suggest that concepts like perseverance, mastery of a skill, progression towards a goal were all associated with positive well-being and happiness. When you are working towards a goal. So real happiness is about working towards something that is bigger than yourself. It's not about reclining on a beach and sipping wine and being with women and the rest of it. The real meaning of happiness is accomplishment, is success, is working towards success because not every goal is intended to be reached. Some goals will not be reached. But the process of working towards that goal, even if you never attain it, is the most enduring and durable and profound form of happiness. The greatest forms of happiness are those happiness that are found in grit and grind and work and effort. And number three, it brings Jannah. Allah said, was sabiqoon as sabiqoon. Those who are foremost today will be the foremost in the hereafter. Those who are first today in doing good deeds in dunya, they will be the first in the hereafter.